In Baltimore, a group of eight officers from the Gun Trace Task Force abused their positions and engaged in various unlawful activities. Instead of upholding their duty to protect and serve, these officers illegally took funds from victims. 13 officers brought down for robbing citizens, falsifying reports, and trying to cover it all up. A man who Baltimore City just paid millions to as part of the settlement in the Gun Trace Task Force scandal. The sergeant who headed the Gun Trace Task Force is not expected to be out of prison until 2038. Has been arrested for attempted murder. This according to Crime and Justice lead investigative reporter Joy LaPola. They unjustly detained individuals, fabricated police reports, and even trafficked substances. These actions eroded public confidence and contributed to a culture of corruption within the police department. Following an inquiry, all eight officers faced charges of conspiring to distribute drugs and engaging in racketeering. The trial revealed the full extent of their wrongdoings and highlighted the systemic problems within the police force that allowed such behavior to go unchecked. The officers were eventually found guilty and the length of their sentences varied depending on their degree of involvement in the crimes. They were handed prison terms, ranging from 7 to 25 years, holding them responsible for their actions. The person that I once was, I'm just a shell of the, the person I once was. I want my life back. The guy who, who passed himself off as Jenkins' representative, who was not a lawyer, was actually one of his former cellmates. Attorney Steve Silverman tells us that he is heartbroken by this news and that the allegations are not consistent with the man he's come to know. This also stands as a warning for others who might plan to abuse their authority. We move on to the Fourth Avenue Jail, where an employee of Maricopa County Correctional Health Services found herself entangled in criminal activities. Latanya Hickbottom was discovered to have been sending explicit photos of herself to an inmate in maximum security, leading to her arrest on charges of promoting prison contraband. The situation unfolded when the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office received a tip that a staff member named Latanya might be engaged in an inappropriate relationship with an inmate named Ramon Cummings. Subsequently, an investigation was launched, during which deputies monitored the communication between the inmate and Hickbottom, revealing suspicious interactions. Giving contraband to a prisoner, it is a class two felony. During the course of this inquiry, it was also revealed that Latanya had deposited $100 into the inmate's canteen account. Following these discoveries, a search of the inmate's cell was conducted uncovering explicit photos of Lytonia and a cell phone. The source of the phone within the jail couldn't be determined. Confronted with the evidence, Lytonia admitted to providing these photos to another inmate, who then passed them on to her imprisoned romantic partner. However, not all the photos found in Cummings' cell were associated with Lytonia. The sheriff's office disclosed that Lytonia had met Cummings and initiated a relationship while working in the Fourth Avenue jail. The inmate that she had a romance with at least had naked photos of the nurse. She gave those photos to a, a, a cellmate or a pod mate, uh, somebody that was also in that housing when he was in medical getting treatment. Uh, then he took those photos back to the inmate. Subsequently, a series of dramatic events unfolded for Latanya. She was already under investigation for unrelated incidents and had been placed on probation. This incident proved to be the final straw. Latanya Hickbottom's case raised questions about her judgment and how she became involved in such a situation. Dr. Michael Azinski commented on this matter, suggesting that an individual with Cummings' criminal history, including allegations of sexual assault, murder, and gang activity, could be a skilled manipulator. When a vulnerable person like Latanya Hickbottom is targeted, boundaries can become blurred and the situation can turn dangerous. To say. It always requires someone with the ability to manipulate as well as to see the vulnerability in somebody else. When it comes to them getting caught, it's very rare that they would stop on their own. In the aftermath, it's likely that she has lost her nursing license. Her behavior reflects her disappointment. Following the investigation, Latanya was terminated and will face charges in an internal affairs court proceeding. We now turn our attention to the Fulton County Jail, 
where Kawana Jenkins found herself in a compromising situation. Kawana was detained for engaging in inappropriate conduct with an inmate and faced multiple charges, including two counts of improper sexual behavior, two counts of cruelty towards an inmate, two counts of reckless conduct, five counts of violating her oath of office, and one count of providing an unauthorized item to an inmate. Kawana had been serving as an officer at the Fulton County Jail since 2019, but her actions caught up with her during a shakedown in the prison's maximum security wing. During this thorough search, a total of 11 phones and weapons were confiscated. Among the discovered materials on one of the phones were videos involving Kawana. In one video, she was seen with an inmate intimately, while the inmate requested an item from her, which turned out to be a pair of Cartier glasses. Another video, which was later leaked to the public, depicted Kawana engaging in explicit actions with an inmate who was still in custody. In this video, notably, she was in her uniform, and these incidents occurred while she was on duty, emphasizing the abuse of her position. After the video went viral, the Fulton County Sheriff's Office issued a statement denouncing her actions and announcing Kawana's termination. They emphasized that the behavior of one individual did not reflect the dedication and integrity of the majority of their staff. The sheriff emphasized their commitment to transparency and accountability for all employees, highlighting the exemplary service provided by the majority of their team. The lady was compromised, and I hope that she can get the help that she needs, but it definitely needs to be away from the sheriff's office. Charles Rambo, a retired sheriff supervisor, expressed concern about the significant risk associated with Kawana letting her guard down especially considering the items confiscated from inmates on the maximum security floor. Kawana Jenkins has not yet been sentenced and remains in detention at the Fulton County Jail while awaiting the court's decision. However, if the court decides on the maximum penalty, she could potentially face up to 20 years in prison. It's ironic that she transitioned from being an employee at the Fulton County Jail to becoming an inmate herself. We turn our attention to the case of Nicholas Evans, who, in March 2019, committed a violent assault on a mentally unstable inmate who was restrained to a chair immediately after turning off his body camera. Another officer later joined in the attack. The proceedings took place in the Cuyahoga County Court of Common Pleas, with Judge John P. O'Donnell presiding. In surveillance footage presented to the court, Nicholas Evans, a corrections officer and jail supervisor at the Cuyahoga County Jail in Cleveland, Ohio, was observed wheeling the victim, 47-year-old Terrence DeBose, into a small cell. DeBose was securely strapped to a chair, making him non-threatening. Nicholas Evans occasionally stood next to the chair, occasionally glancing at the door, while DeBose seemed to engage in a conversation with him based on his head, shoulder, and hand movements. A few minutes later, Evans was seen reaching for his body camera, turning it off, and then proceeding to punch the inmate five times in the head and face. A second officer, Timothy Dugan, entered and punched DeBose in the head. The inmate was unable to defend himself due to his restraints. Dugan delivered two punches, while Evans directed six in total. Following the attack, Evans and Dugan were observed engaging in what appeared to be a conversation. Shortly after, a nurse entered the cell to attend to the injured inmate. As a result of the assault, DeBose sustained a concussion, with the majority of the blows concentrated on his head and face. DeBose's brother, Emmanuel, spoke with news reporters and expressed his outrage at the situation. He sought justice for his brother and emphasized that the actions of the officers were unjust. The assault remained undisclosed until investigator Robert DeSimone spoke with the jail's medical director, Dr. Thomas Tallman, as part of an inquiry into the incident. It was during this conversation that DeSimone learned about the attack. Dr. Tallman disclosed that he had examined DeBose and found that he displayed post-concussion symptoms, for which he was referred to Metro Health. A doctor there concluded that DeBose's head and neck injuries were similar to those sustained in a car crash. Subsequently, both Evans and Dugan were charged and arrested for their cruel treatment of the helpless inmate. Evans faced a charge of criminal assault, carrying a potential three-year prison sentence, 
while Dugan faced a misdemeanor assault charge. During Evans' sentencing, Special Assistant Ohio Attorney General Matthew Meyer described the attack on DeBose as brutal and premeditated. And you saw on that tape that he went through a thought process. Even though he was under a stressful situation and he was losing his temper, he reached up and turned that body camera off because he knew he was about to do something brutal. And he did not want that body camera to catch, capture the evidence of what he was about to do. And there's a thought process there. My, I just think maybe they should get maybe a year or something. A year in jail? Yeah. Just they, should, they, should, they should experience incarceration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because I didn't do nothing to deserve that. Meyer also played an audio recording during which he interviewed DeBose and inquired about what he wanted to see in terms of prosecution for his attackers. Meyer emphasized the severity of the incident, comparing it to torture, and challenged anyone to experience a similar situation to understand its extent. Evans initially defended the attack, claiming that he had reacted to offensive comments made by the inmate about his family. His defense lawyer, Robert Dixon, highlighted Evans' previous textbook record as an employee and suggested that the video, while shocking, portrayed a good man on his worst day. I'd like to start by saying there are no words to fix what I've done. I would like the court to know that I understand the seriousness of my offenses. There are no excuses for my behavior. With that being said, I'd like to apologize to Mr. DeBose for the pain I've caused him. Subsequently, Judge John P. O'Donnell sentenced Evans to nine months in prison while Dugan received a 10-day prison sentence. During the reading of the sentences, Evans displayed no visible emotions. we return to the maximum security Clinton Correctional Facility in upstate New York, where another case of inappropriate conduct involving a corrections officer has emerged, indicating Joyce Mitchell aiding her lover and cellmate in an escape. This time, the individual in question is Denise Prell, who was hired around the same time Joyce was sentenced to prison. Approximately a year later, Denise started a relationship with an inmate leading to her termination from the correctional facility and charges that included one count of second-degree promoting prison contraband, one count of third-degree sexual abuse, and 23 counts of official misconduct. So, Your Honor, she would leave a formal reading of the charges and then not get to plead all 25 yeah. So she is out on a $5,000 cash bail and the people um, have no objection to that continuing. She's made every uh, court appearance. According to court documents, the inmate and Denise confessed to falling in love. They agreed to using aliases in their letters, with Gwen Freeman being the alias under which they communicated. Gwen was a combination of Gwendolyn, which is Denise's middle name, and Freeman, hinted at the inmate's eventual release. Their interaction evolved to include phone calls, and Denise even acquired a phone for the inmate from Walmart. She sent him $350 to his prison account and they planned to live together once he was free. Their physical involvement began in the tailor shop at the facility, and they admitted to engaging in intimate acts over their clothing. I don't think that that uh, charge is supported by any of the evidence uh, that I've seen, even taking everything that's been said is true. Um, and we're certainly not doing that either. So we reject. The inmate who was imprisoned for first degree manslaughter was later transferred to Elmira Correctional Facility, but their relationship continued, including visits where they reportedly shared physical affection. The revelation of this unlawful affair came to light when another corrections officer discovered that Denise was engaged in sexual relations with the inmate. A joint investigation was initiated by the state police, the State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision, and the Clinton County District Attorney's Office confirming the existence of close relations between Prell and the inmate. In a system this large, obviously you're going to have deviations. The question is, you have the systems in place to catch them and resolve them. And that's exactly what we did here. Denise initially pleaded not guilty to all 25 charges. Her attorney's plan was to file a motion to reduce her charges, but she was granted bail before the trial. 
During the course of the case, the prosecution offered Denise a plea deal in which she could plead guilty to a felony count of promoting prison contraband in exchange for a reduced sentence. Your criminality in this matter, which you've pled guilty to, is, is difficult, if not nearly impossible, to understand uh, in light of what this community uh, went through. This case gathered significant attention, especially due to prior incidents at the correctional facility involving inappropriate relationships and jailbreaks. Even the then governor, Andrew Cuomo, commented on the charges. At her sentencing, Denise displayed emotions and tears. She ultimately accepted another plea deal and pleaded guilty to the charges, resulting in a one-year prison sentence for her. A former Colorado police officer, Austin Hopp, who was involved in the arrest of Karen Garner, an elderly woman with dementia in 2020, has been sentenced to five years in prison. Hopp, a former Loveland Police Department officer, appeared in Larimer County Court after pleading guilty to charges related to the June 26, 2020 arrest. In this incident, a federal lawsuit claimed that police officers slammed Karen Garner, who was 73 years old at the time, to the ground and hogtied her. Hop was also sentenced to three years of mandatory parole. I love it. I love it. I what you saw in the vid video, it's not the Loveland Police Department. Austin Hop and Daria Jalali, along with former community service officer Tyler Blackett, are no longer employed with the Loveland Police Department. I share the community's concerns on this. I've been in law enforcement 32 years, and what I saw in there uh, hurt me. The arrest occurred after Garner was accused of shoplifting approximately $14 worth of items from a Walmart. Garner's attorney stated that she has dementia and sensory aphasia, which impair her ability to communicate verbally and understand others. Due to her dementia, she forgot to pay for the items, which were ultimately retrieved by Walmart employees. Body camera video released by the attorney revealed Hop telling Garner to stop and talk to him as she walked home. In the video, Garner was seen shrugging her shoulders as she continued to walk. Hop then forcibly took Garner to the ground and handcuffed her. A second officer, Daria Jalali, arrived and assisted Hop as they walked Garner toward a police car. The video showed them struggling to place Garner in the back of the car. Hop, as seen in the video, instructed Jalali to help him get Garner on the ground and then proceeded to hog tie her by her ankles, forcing her into the car. As a result of this incident, Garner suffered a dislocated shoulder, a fractured arm, and a sprained wrist, according to the lawsuit. The city settled the lawsuit for $3 million in September. That lacking to get folks medical attention will not be tolerated. This abuse of force will not be tolerated. The treating members of our community inhumanely will not be tolerated. And that celebrating such behavior will not be tolerated. We failed and we are very sorry for that. Another video released by the attorney showed Hop and other officers at the police station laughing and joking about the arrest. Hop had previously accepted a plea deal for the assault charge despite opposition from Garner's family. At the Fresno County Court, the case of Tina Gonzalez, a corrections officer from California, unfolds. Gonzalez, a young female officer, has been prosecuted for engaging in sexual activity with an inmate in full view of 11 other inmates at the Fresno County Jail. This case dives into the actions of an officer who took sexual misconduct and disregard for discipline to an extreme level. They were involved. This wasn't just only affecting my mom and my family. Charges that they could have put against these officers. I feel like they think that they're above the law. The lack of empathy in the action of the officers. I feel like these are pretty minimal crimes. PTSD from all of this, and it has truly changed the progression. We haven't seen that since. She doesn't smile since then. That's sex with an inmate and having intercourse in full view of 11 other inmates is something only a depraved mind can come up with. In December 2019, the Fresno County Sheriff's Office initiated an investigation into the correctional officer following a tip from staff members about an inmate possessing a cell phone. It was revealed that the inmate was in a relationship with Gonzalez, who had provided him with the contraband. 
a thorough search of the inmate's cell led to the discovery of the cell phone. Gonzalez was then brought in for questioning by detectives, and she later resigned from her position at the sheriff's office. However, this was not the end of the matter. The fact that she continually calls, has sexually explicit conversations with the inmate in question, and even most about the crime she carried out shows that she's incapable of owning up to her mistakes, it will undoubtedly continue in the future. A detailed investigation uncovered that Gonzalez had engaged in sexual activity with the inmate. In addition to the cell phone, she supplied the inmate with razors, considered weapons in prison. Gonzalez would also tip off the inmate about upcoming cell inspections, allowing him time to hide the contraband he had. Even after her arrest, Gonzalez remained not sorry, maintaining contact with the inmate and boasting about her actions. I think what you did was terrible, stupid, you ruined your career, you endangered your fellow officers, but I also believe that people can redeem themselves. You got the rest of your life to prove it. In 2021, Gonzalez pleaded guilty to a felony count of sexual activity by a detention facility employee with a consenting confined adult, a felony count of possession of drugs or an alcoholic beverage in a jail facility, and a misdemeanor count of possession of a cellular device with intent to deliver to an inmate. While her superiors expressed deep disappointment in her behavior, her defense attorney, Martin Talaisnik, argued that Gonzalez took responsibility for her actions due to her vulnerability at the time. He emphasized that her marriage had recently ended, and it was never her intention to harm or endanger the employees or inmates in the jail. However, Judge Michael did not share this perspective. Prior to delivering her sentence, the judge strongly condemned her actions, characterizing them as stupid. As a result, Gonzalez was sentenced to 210 days in jail and placed on two years of probation. While she could have faced a 16-month sentence, the judge took into consideration her lack of criminal history and her early admission of guilt. Throughout the sentencing process, Gonzalez displayed no emotions and remained silent. In the Cuyahoga County Common Pleas Court, we are presented with the case of a corrections officer who, apparently intoxicated with the authority he had, resorted to attacking a restrained female inmate. Idris Farid Clark, on July 16, 2018, employed pepper foam on an inmate who had been placed on a restraint chair. The presiding judge, Dick Ambrose, is tasked with delivering justice in this matter. The victim, Chantel Glass, had originally been arrested and imprisoned following a police response to a heated argument reported by her sister. Simultaneously, it was discovered that Glass had failed to attend a previous traffic ticket hearing in an unrelated case, leading to a court order to hold her on bail. Realizing her dilemma, Glass pleaded with the corrections officers to allow her to make a phone call so she could arrange for someone to babysit her three children. However, her request was denied. According to Glass's attorney, Ashley Sletvold, one of the corrections officers had warned her that if she continued protesting, they would secure her in a restraint chair and employ pepper spray. A surveillance video presented in court showed Clark taking out a canister of pepper spray and shaking it as he and another officer, Robert Marsh, went to retrieve Glass from her cell. In the video, Marsh attempted to secure her to the chair, and when she extended her legs towards him, he struck her in the face with the base of his palm. In response, she kicked back at him, prompting Clark to step forward and spray pepper foam directly in Glass's face. He then grabbed her hair, tilted her head backward, and continued to spray her face. Throughout this incident, Clark was wearing a body camera, but it had been turned off. Fortunately, a surveillance camera captured the brutal attack. It wasn't until he was wheeling her to a sink that the body camera was turned on and Glass was seen screaming for the officers to wipe her face because it burned. This was a torturous experience for Glass, especially considering she had asthma and high blood pressure, making it challenging to breathe. Clark was also observed directing three short bursts of water from a hose directly onto Glass's face, causing the foam to spread down the front of her body resulting in extreme pain that Sletvold equated to childbirth. Glass screamed, and Clark was overheard saying he would take her to the nurse. 
Nurse, please, man. You're breathing or you wouldn't be screaming. In one segment of the video, Glass screamed about her difficulty breathing, and the nurse could be heard responding, you're breathing or you wouldn't be screaming. After her release, Chantel decided to file a lawsuit against the officers, leading to charges and arrests of Clark and Marsh when authorities became aware of the situation. I sat in that chair that day and prayed over and over again that I wouldn't die. According to Special Prosecutor Matthew Meyer, Glass, who stood at just 5 feet 2 inches tall, did not pose any threats to either of the officers involved. The surveillance footage also indicated that Glass had not kicked Marsh until after he had struck her. This was not a response to a threat. Meyer argued that it was an abuse of power for the sake of punishment. After Clark was charged, he was recorded in a phone call on August 7th, where he threatened a fellow officer to testify on his behalf at trial. The recording revealed that Clark threatened to release videos of a use of force incident involving the officer in the jail. Clark, however, told the judge that the whole story had not been told. He claimed that Glass had been troublesome and had already threatened to kick Marsh before he used the pepper foam on her. While he apologized for making Glass feel violated, he did not apologize for his actions. In contrast, Marsh issued an apology to Glass, acknowledging that he had disgraced himself, his profession, and his family. Judge Dick Ambrose ultimately sentenced Clark to 18 months in prison after he pleaded guilty to criminal assault, unlawful restraint, and extortion while being cleared of the rest of the charges. Marsh, on the other hand, received a sentence of 30 days in a local jail. As the judge read out their sentences, Clark's behavior remained empty of emotion. In a disturbing case from Arizona, we turn our attention to the actions of a juvenile corrections officer, Emery Waller, and her affair with a parolee who was once an inmate under her care. Emery had recently started working at the correctional facility when allegations arose against her. She is now facing charges of one count of unlawful sexual conduct with a person in custody. The details of the inappropriate relationship came to light when another corrections officer discovered explicit Snapchat messages and photos exchanged between Emery and a paralee. The nature of these messages and images left no doubt that the two were engaged in a romantic relationship. The inmate involved, although released to community supervision and living in a group home, was still technically under the department's jurisdiction. During the investigation, deputies found several explicit photos of MRE on the inmate's phone. They also discovered similar content featuring the parolee on MRE's phone. The investigators who examined MRE's phone found multiple sexually explicit pictures and videos of people who were identified as the former inmate and Waller. Emery was subsequently arrested, and during her interrogation, she confirmed the legitimacy of these findings. When the 18-year-old ex-inmate with whom Emery had a relationship was interviewed, he claimed that the contact between them was consensual. However, the law did not view it that way. There was an additional concern that their contact may have occurred when he was still a minor, which would result in a separate charge. The victim had initially met Emery when he was attending the Adobe Mountain School at the Adobe Department of Juvenile Corrections. Although there was no evidence to suggest they engaged while at the facility, their relationship was still considered unlawful. Emery's role as a corrections officer and the power dynamic between them made the relationship unacceptable. What increased Emery's legal troubles was her reaction when arrested and interrogated. During the interrogation, she requested to use the bathroom, but instead brought contraband in the form of an Apple Watch. She used the Apple Watch to communicate with her 18-year-old victim, reaching out to her roommate and instructing her to tell the paralee to deny all allegations and delete any evidence from his phone. This action effectively amounted to an admission of wrongdoing and could result in additional charges against her. Emery knew she had made a serious mistake, and her response during the interrogation indicated this. She repeatedly acknowledged that she had messed up, and her realization that her life would never be the same weighed heavily on her. Emery is now in custody awaiting sentencing, having lost her job and respect and facing potential registration as a sex offender. 
Her fate now rests in the hands of the Maricopa County Attorney's Office as determined by the Arizona Department of Juvenile Corrections. David Carrick, a former police officer in England, abused his position of authority by engaging in abusive relationships with multiple women he met on dating apps. Carrick's behavior included physical attacks, controlling their actions, and depriving them of basic needs such as food. The influence of men like you in positions of power stands in the way of a revolution of women's dignity. There were many signs that we should have joined together. He should have been rooted out during his career as a police officer. The system is so rotten, public trust has fallen so far, that tinkering around the edges is not going to cut it. Court salutes the courage of all the victims and their families, and I hope they're able to thrive in the rest of their lives. Despite numerous complaints of domestic issues against him, Carrick was astonishingly reinstated as an armed police officer in 2017. However, his crimes eventually caught up with him when he was reported for physical misconduct. Carrick was suspended from police work and later pleaded guilty to a total of 49 charges, which included 24 counts of physical misconduct. The severity of Carrick's actions horrified the public and led to strong criticism from officials. Carrick's sentence was nothing short of severe, as he received 36 life sentences, each carrying a minimum term of 30 years. This sentencing emphasized the seriousness of his offenses. Carrick's case serves as a reminder of the urgency to address issues of domestic abuse within law enforcement agencies and the vital need to implement strict measures to safeguard the safety and well-being of individuals who are vulnerable to such abuses. This, this is the allegation that's been made to us, okay, sir? There's no necessity. Yes, there is. These women are not weak or ineffectual. They were victims of your criminal mindset. When you sign up to become a police officer, you sign up to a certain set of values and standards, a code of conduct. He's a man who relentlessly degraded, belittled, assaulted and raped women. And if David Carrick didn't have that compass to begin with, how did he end up serving within the ranks of a police force? In a troubling case at the Miami-Dade County Court, Judge Betty Capote Urban presided over the trial of a former Miami-Dade corrections officer, Julian Gonzalez, who was convicted on three counts of rape. Gonzalez faced multiple criminal charges, including three counts of kidnapping with a deadly weapon and 20 counts of armed sexual battery. Miami-Dade corrections officer who has been in the force for more than a decade is facing serious charges this morning. Prosecutors say he kidnapped and raped a woman who he was supervising on house arrest. Gonzalez, a former 11-year employee of the Miami-Dade Corrections and Rehabilitation Department, was first arrested in September 2019 following the rape of a 43-year-old woman a month earlier. He had been assigned to supervise her at home while she was on home arrest awaiting trial. The victim reported that Gonzalez had started expressing romantic interest by sending suggestive text messages. However, he used threats to force her, fearing that he would send her back to jail. Surveillance video and GPS tracking data further verified her claims, showing that Gonzalez had taken her to a North Miami adult-only motel in his department-issued vehicle on multiple occasions. He was arrested and charged with four counts of armed kidnapping and armed sexual battery. The case took a more sinister turn when another woman came forward a month after his initial arrest. The 26-year-old woman, who had been on house arrest since October 2018, revealed that Gonzalez had repeatedly abused her during his time as her probation officer. She, too, stated that he had forced her into engaging in explicit acts, using threats of violating her house arrest status and the fear of imprisonment. She reported that Gonzalez kept a handgun on his ankle, further intimidating her into obedience. He had driven her to the same next motel on multiple occasions where he had abused her. In other instances, he ordered her to drive herself to the motel, where he would meet her, which occurred over 20 times between March and September 2019. A few weeks later, a third victim came forward, reporting sexual abuse by Gonzalez. This 32-year-old woman revealed that she had been raped multiple times while on house arrest under his supervision. 
Four counts of armed kidnapping, four counts of armed sexual battery, find probable cause, and on each of those eight counts, Mr. Gonzalez will be held no bond. Gonzalez, who was already imprisoned at the Turner Guilford Knight Correctional Center, appeared in court and was denied bond following the latest charges. He eventually pleaded guilty to sexual battery charges as part of a plea agreement with prosecutors. In June 2021, he was sentenced to 10 years in prison for his monstrous crimes against these women under his supervision. This sentence was followed by an additional 10 years of parole and a mandatory status as a registered sexual predator. As the judge read out his sentence, Gonzalez stood in the courtroom, his face lacking any emotion. In an unusual turn of events, we find ourselves at Wayne County Jail, where a prison guard finds herself facing the consequences of her actions, effectively transitioning from a position of authority to that of an inmate. Gemma Cowperthwaite, a former officer at St. Clair County Jail, was accused of engaging intimately with a female inmate at her residence in Fort Gratio. The charges brought against her included sexual assault with intent to commit penetration, potentially carrying a sentence of up to 10 years in prison. She took a liking to me. She'd asked me if I could talk to her outside of the facility when she got out. And I told her, that, no, not really. So I gave her my phone number and said, you know, if you want to contact me, if you want to talk outside of here, then I'm okay with it. According to Gemma, their connection began when the inmate was on work release and visited her home. The inmate requested permission to shower at Gemma's place, explaining that she wished to avoid using the prison's facilities upon her return. Their relationship developed from there, although Gemma maintained that there was no significant abuse of power, at least not to the extent claimed by the inmate. However, Gemma should have been aware that consensual relationships with inmates are not allowed due to the power dynamics. As their relationship deepened, Gemma stated that the inmate began requesting favors, some of which she agreed to perform, motivated by kindness. Right minus the fact that what the illegal part of this whole thing would be the sexual side to it, and there was not a sexual side to it. Gemma argued that, technically, the law disapproves of the sexual aspect of the relationship, and in her case, there was absolutely no sexual involvement. However, if there was no such element, one may wonder why Gemma agreed to a plea deal. The reason for this decision was Gemma's inability to handle the legal proceedings. I couldn't handle uh, two to four years of solitary confinement in, in prison. I didn't think I could convince 12 random strangers that this didn't happen. She was the one to reach out to me. She was the one to come to me. She was the one to ask me for help. When the offense was reported to the appropriate authorities, an investigation was initiated, leading to a warrant for her arrest. Gemma subsequently turned herself in. During her sentencing, the judge emphasized that she had betrayed the trust of the sheriff and the court system. Gemma ultimately pleaded guilty to sexual assault with intent to commit penetration and was sentenced to 10 months in jail, with four months suspended upon the payment of fines and court costs, as well as mandatory registration as a sex offender. A former Hamden County correctional officer is being held without bail tonight after a judge found him guilty of having sex with inmates. We now find ourselves at the Hampton County Superior Court, where Judge John S. Ferrara presided over the case of Willie Williamson. Williamson, a former correctional officer who worked at the Western Massachusetts Regional Women's Correctional Center in Chicopee, was found guilty of engaging in sexual relationships with two inmates. Willie Williamson initially served as a correctional officer at the Western Massachusetts Regional Women's Correctional Center in Chicopee. However, in 2016, he was transferred to a maintenance officer role, which gave him the opportunity to have some inmates from the minimum security section accompany him on landscaping assignments outside the prison. These women volunteered to help Williamson only after completing their regular duties within the facility, and two women volunteered, According to the prosecutor, Assistant District Attorney Catherine A. Johnston, Williamson did not appear to have been attracted to the women initially. The women reported that he treated them as friends, even offering one of them alcohol, energy drinks, and cigarettes 
in exchange for accompanying him into the woods. However, he eventually engaged with one of the women, providing her with cigarettes in exchange for her silence, as he did not want anyone to know. He also began having explicit relations with the other woman, sometimes engaging in the act with both women when they went out together. Accusations regarding Williamson's involvement with these women started to surface, and the women were brought in for questioning. Connie Burke of the Hampton County Sheriff's Department reported that one of the women took her to the location where she claimed to have been with Williamson, and Newport cigarettes were found in the vicinity. By December 2016, Williamson was fired for violating his training as an officer, which prohibited any contact with inmates, and he was subsequently charged in court. District Attorney Johnston stated, By law in Massachusetts, inmates are deemed incapable of consenting to sexual contact with an employee of a correctional facility. However, Williamson's defense lawyer, Jeffrey S. Brown, argued that there was no evidence to support the suspected conduct. He also pointed out that the two women who accused Williamson of engaging in sexual activity were friends before their imprisonment together, and one of them had initially denied the encounters before changing her statement during a third questioning session. Henley County DA spokesman Jim Lydon told 22 News, Willie Williamson was found guilty on four counts of a prison guard having relations with a prisoner. Despite the defense's arguments, Williamson was found guilty and convicted on four counts of a prison guard having intimacy with a prisoner. In 2019, Judge John S. Ferrara sentenced the former correctional officer to 60 days in jail and one year of probation. This sentence might be considered relatively lenient, given that Massachusetts general law demands that anyone employed at a correctional institution who engages in sexual relations with an inmate could face up to five years in state prison, a fine of $10,000, or both. As the judge read out Williamson's sentence, the former officer was observed with his head lowered seemingly reflecting on the offense he had committed. The story of Daniel Saylor's fall from grace is indeed a cautionary tale. It serves as a reminder that even those in positions of authority with the noblest of intentions can find themselves caught up in a web of corruption and trickery. My life has basically changed dramatically. I, I spent my whole career serving this country and serving the state of Florida. Police chief admits he misused his badge. Daniel Saylor used to be Windermere's police chief. Saylor's attorney is asking for probation and community service for the former disgraced police chief. Saylor's dedication to maintaining justice and protecting the charm of Windermere led him on a path of investigation where he believed he was on a mission for truth and justice. Today, his plea deal makes him a common criminal. The judge says with Sailor's freedom on the line, he just needs more time to decide his fate. Uh, but I did that to myself, and I understand that now, um, that I take full responsibility for what happened. My life has basically changed dramatically. I, I spent my whole career serving this country and serving the state of Florida. However, as he dug deeper into the case, he encountered powerful figures who were determined to protect their secrets and privileges. This resistance, along with the difficulties of the case, eventually led to legal troubles for Saylor. Accused of perjury and facing a relentless prosecution, he found himself on trial for his actions. The courtroom battle was fierce, and the verdict ultimately led to his conviction and an eight-year prison sentence. Police officer that finds themselves in this situation, there's going to be a a watch just to make sure they're okay. I told the court every day in this courtroom we depend on people telling the truth. And if you don't tell the truth, there has to be ramifications for that. Uh, but I did that to myself and I understand that now, um, that I take full responsibility for what happened. The judge says with Sailor's freedom on the line, he just needs more time to decide his fate. In the end, the judge indicated that he has to turn over his guns and he's going to turn them over to the Seminole County. Whether Saylor was a victim or a fallen hero is a subject of debate. His story highlights the importance of maintaining integrity and ethical conduct in positions of authority and the potential consequences when that trust is compromised. Windermere, once a symbol of peacefulness, was forever changed by the revelations that emerged, and Saylor's legacy was stained by shame and disgrace.
17 Court Watch tonight. A man was given a lengthy sentence today for his role in a murderous love triangle between Kern Correctional Officers. The case of Rigoberto Sanchez is indeed a tragic and disturbing one, marked by jealousy, rage, and violence. His actions on that fateful night had devastating consequences, resulting in the death of his estranged wife's lover, Edwin Lima. It's clear that emotions run high in this love triangle, and Sanchez's response to his jealousy is extreme and fatal. During the trial, Sanchez claimed that he acted in self-defense, but the prosecution argued that his actions were premeditated. His decision to pack belongings, drop one gun while retaining a loaded one, an attempt to manipulate the situation by asking his stepson not to stay at Sandra's apartment painted a picture of premeditation. Judge Gary T. Friedman's sentencing of 80 years and four months to life in prison reflects the seriousness of the crimes committed. As he read out the verdict, Sanchez appeared to carry a heavy burden of shame and the consequences of his actions. This case serves as a tragic reminder of how uncontrolled emotions can lead to terrible outcomes and the importance of peaceful conflict resolution. The case of Nancy Gonzalez and Ronald Wilson is certainly a complex and troubling one, involving an inappropriate relationship between a corrections officer and an inmate as well as a pregnancy that further complicated the situation. The fact that Nancy Gonzalez had relationships with multiple co-workers and another inmate only added to the disgrace and misconduct within the Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn. The circumstances surrounding this case raise serious concerns about the ethics and security within the prison system, as an inmate cannot legally consent to sexual activity due to the power dynamics at play. While the defense tried to portray Nancy Gonzalez as a sympathetic figure with a difficult life, the intentional nature of her actions, especially getting pregnant, worked against her during the court proceedings. Nancy Gonzalez's sentence of one year and a day in federal prison, as well as losing custody of her child due to substance abuse, reflects the seriousness of her actions and the consequences she faced as a result. This case serves as a reminder of the importance of maintaining the professionalism and integrity of those working within the correctional system. The case of Joyce Mitchell and the escape of David Sweat and Richard Matt from an upstate New York prison is indeed a dramatic and fascinating one. Joyce's involvement in helping the prisoners escape by providing tools and planning to meet them outside the prison shows the serious breach of her responsibilities as a prison worker. Joyce Mitchell's claim that she only helped the inmates because she believed they had threatened her family, particularly her husband, adds a layer of complexity to the case. It's clear that the inmates used her vulnerability and fear to manipulate her into assisting their escape. I did wrong. I deserve to be punished. But, you know, people need to know that I was only trying to save my family. The inmates' extravagant escape plan which involved cutting through cell walls, breaking through a brick wall, and crawling through a steam pipe was like something out of a movie. The fact that they successfully executed this plan and managed to stay on the run for several weeks led to a statewide search and widespread concern. We don't know if they are still in the immediate area or if they are in uh, Mexico. By now. Mitchell, I just don't find that explanation credible. Your husband's life would not have been more in danger by exposing the plot to escape. Joyce Mitchell's ultimate arrest and sentencing reflect the seriousness of her actions. The judge's words during her sentencing, where he emphasized the severity of her actions and her misplaced belief that the plea deal was too harsh, serve as a reminder of the consequences of her involvement in the escape. While you express remorse for the harm you caused the community, you also stated that you believe the negotiated sentence is too harsh. Taking into consideration all the various sentencing factors, I can assure you, you have nothing to complain about with the negotiated sentence. For the reasons stated, I will approve 
be sentenced and proceed as follows. Her sentence of two and one third years to seven years in prison, along with a fine of $5,000, reflects the legal consequences she faced for her role in the escape. I can assure you, you have nothing to complain about with the negotiating sentence. For the reasons stated, I will approve the sentence and proceed as follows. This case's infamy even led to a Golden Globe winning miniseries based on the events. Big thanks to our viewers for joining the courtroom journey with us. Your interest in the stories of justice is what keeps our channel alive.